Hello Trinity, we welcome you and are so glad that you've joined us for digital worship this morning. Before I read the call to worship, I want to remind you of a couple things. We have men's and women's Bible study coming up for this spring semester, and those begin next week. And for the women, there are two options, and the, both of those are on Wednesday. Wednesday morning via Zoom from 7 to 8 a.m., and then Wednesday evening from 7.30 to 8.45 p.m., and that will be at Anna Johnston's home, and they will also have Zoom set up for people to join in if you're unable to make it in person. Now for the men, there are two options as well. On Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. with Pastor Julio at Panera Bread, and then on Thursday morning with Pastor Ben at 7 a.m. via Zoom. Now hear these words from Psalm 33, verses 18 through 22, to prepare our hearts to enter into worship. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our hope and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Amen. Let us sing together.
Our primary desire in worship is to enter into the presence of the living Lord. And in order to do that, we confess our sins. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, you have delivered us from the dominion of sin and death and brought us into the kingdom of your beloved Son. Grant that as by his death he has called us to life, so by his love he may, he may raise us to eternal joys, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. so great Jesus in all things I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years still I'll be singing how can I praise you enough how can I praise you enough Welcome and thank you for joining us this morning or whenever you are joining. I'm excited today to get back into our series in the Gospel of Matthew as we're going through the Sermon on the Mount. And we've come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 12 today. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up and turn there with me. And it's, it's probably going to be good just to remind ourselves of the basic structure and what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. Now, there are three main sections to the Sermon on the Mount. The first one it focuses on our doctrinal life and the authority of Jesus' word. 
The second one is on our devotional life and how not to be a spiritual hypocrite. And then this is part of this third section, our daily life, the authenticity of our walk. And in this section, the central focus is all about healthy relationships. Now, as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things that's been most surprising to me is how central in every section, even the doctrinal section and the devotional section, but how central in every section is the reality of relationship. And one of the key themes is that the quality of your life will primarily be dependent on the quality of your relationships. And that's a theme that runs through every single section. And so one of the most important things for you personally, for you in 2021, is to reconnect and reestablish and reaffirm and restore the central relationships in your life. You know, one of the great challenges of this past year is that all of our relationships have been significantly strained. Every relationship you have has some stress or strain that has been placed upon it. And that strain has caused some relationships to break and has caused others to be strengthened. And one of the things that we're going to repeat all throughout this this coming year is that one of the biggest needs that we all have is to reconnect relationally. And the Sermon on the Mount is such a beautiful prescription for healthy relationships. And so one of the most important questions you can ask is, what do healthy relationships look like? What do healthy relationships with God, what does that look like? What does a healthy relationship with God look like? What does a healthy relationship with myself look like? What does a healthy relationship with other people look like? What does a healthy relationship with people who are hostile to you, difficult people? What does that look like? And the most important thing in your life is healthy relationships with God, yourself, others. And the quality of your life will primarily be dependent on the quality of your relationships, not ultimately on the quality of your health care, the quality of your water, the quality of your air, the quality of your internet, or the quality of your kids' schools. The most important thing in your life is the quality of relationships. And so as we move into chapter 7, this is a great place just to remind mind ourselves of what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. But now, as we begin, you know, chapter 7 offers some unique challenges. And one of the challenges is the first verse in chapter 7. Judge not, lest you be judged. You know, Eric Bargerhuff, and Eric, if you're watching, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, but he's got this interesting book called The Most Misused Verses in the Bible. And uh, the subtitle is Surprising Ways God's Word is Misunderstood. And he actually ranks what he, kind of tongue-in-cheek, you know, the top 17 most misquoted verses in the Bible. And do you know what number one is on his list? You got it. Matthew 7, verse 1. And it's one of the few verses that even people who have no awareness or no conceptual knowledge of the Bible or Christianity, somehow they know this verse and can quote it. And he says, it's really interesting to kind of think about what are the settings in which someone who maybe is not a Christian or doesn't even claim to follow or know anything about Jesus, but would use this verse, don't judge, don't judge. So think about the times or the settings when this verse would be pulled out. Now, so you can imagine that there's a group of friends, they're at a sports bar, On Saturday night, they're all watching maybe an NFL playoff game. They're all cheering for their beloved team that hadn't been in the playoffs in 20 years, and none of them really like the current quarterback, and he makes a bad play, and then they all start going, Ah, what a bum! When are we going to get rid of that bozo? You think, does anybody stop the conversation and say, Whoa, 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 whoa. Judge not, lest you be judged. Or maybe you find yourself in a in a heated political discussion where people are very adamant and talking passionately about politics, and maybe there's uh, one side of the aisle that they're decrying and talking about, ah, oh, all these bums in Washington, we need to throw them all out. Do you think anybody stops the conversation and says, uh uh-uh, uh uh, judge not, lest you be judged? Or maybe you see someone out on the street and you're wearing a new dress and they say, oh, we love that dress. It's so cute. You look so cute in that dress. Do you stop them and say, uh, 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 excuse me? Who are you to judge me? 
Or maybe it's the day after your kid's school play and someone comes up to you and says, oh, your daughter in the play was so precious. She was so cute and did her, did her line so well. Do you stop them at that moment and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Who do you think you are to judge my child? Judge not. I mean, this is a problem with you Christians. You're just judgy, judging people all the time, calling my dress pretty and my child cute. You know, we don't object to that kind of judgment. So the question is, what kind of judgments are objectionable? What kind of judgments do we object to? And actually, if you think about it, the reality is that is that everyone judges. Everyone is passing judgment all of the time. We all judge. The only question is, in what spirit, by what criteria, what's the goal do you actually judge? See, the real question is not, will you judge? But the real question is, what type of judge will you be? Will you be the type of judge who issues judgments that are true, that are wise, that are loving, the question is not, will you judge, but what type of judge will you be? Will your judgments be tainted by appearances, or will you have the ability to look beneath the surface? Will your judgment be knee-jerk, impulsive, go-with-the-flow, reactionary type things? Or will it be actually rooted in truth? Will your judgments be the kind of judgments that are just simply meant to appease people, or are you genuinely seeking the full flourishing for as many people as possible. See, the question is not, will you judge? It's just, what kind of judge will you be? Will you be loving or condemning? Will you be wise or foolish? Will you be true or false? And what Jesus is going to give us here in verses 1 through 12 of Matthew chapter 7, in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to teach us the wise and loving art of speck removal. So what we're going to learn here is, is how we can become wise and loving, and gracious, and compassionate in our judgments. And can you think of anything that our country needs more right now than sober, wise, compassionate people? Everybody's issuing their judgments. But the question is, what type of judgment is being issued? So let's first look at the text. So we're going to read it. And as we do, this is really challenging. So a couple of things you want to think through as I think through it, because on the one hand, it seems almost like there's no coherence. I mean, at first glance, you'll think, man, what's going on? Does Jesus have some type of serious ADD? Is he like a squirrel or he's just boing, don't judge? Well, you do have to judge between dogs and pigs. And then here's how you pray. And then here's the golden rule just bouncing all over the place. Or is there some connecting thread? So listen, think, what is the connecting thread that's holding all of these things together? We're going to give Jesus the benefit of the doubt that he was a wise master teacher and he knows things that we don't. So you're going to look for the connecting thread. And as I read, try and listen for the key words. That'll give you some helpful context. And then you want to notice some of the movement. So judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that's in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take out the speck from your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take out the log of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to take out the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample you underfoot and turn and attack you. Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. 
So a couple things, just notice the frame. Notice how it ends. This is the law and the prophets. And the major teaching block in this section started. The introduction in 5 runs all the way to verse 17. But then chapter 5, verse 17, he says, Do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. So remember, that's an inclusio that gives us the frame. The law and the prophets. This whole section from 517 all the way to 712 is actually going to frame what does it mean for Jesus to fulfill the law and the prophets. This is how we fulfill all of the commands of the Old Testament. So that's given us our frame. Now, did you notice some of the key words? How often did you hear the word brother, your brother, your brother? And then when it turns to God, it's your father. So those are family words. It's in a family context. So brothers, sisters, it, that's talking about people who you love. They're a part of this new community that he's creating, your brother. But then did you also notice when it got down to the prayer section, how often the word ask, ask, seek, knock, ask. Which of you whose son, if they ask, will he give him what he asked for? Ask. So this key thing, ask, ask, ask. So the connecting thread that's running through this, it seems to be disjointed, but the key connecting thread is the key connecting thread of the whole sermon. It's all about relationships your relationship with God. Do you see him as father and do you come to him and you ask something specific? Do you ask things of him? Your relationships with outsiders, hostile outsiders, how do you deal with, that's what he calls the pigs and the dogs. How do you deal with outsiders? And then how do you deal with difficult relationships with brothers, family, people that you are close to? So in many ways, this passage is like a beautiful flower that you kind of have to un, unwrap. I don't know, do you unwrap flowers or unfold? And the core is your relationship with God in 7 through 11. You see him as a heavenly father who you go and you ask. And we'll come back to this next week. But this is so important because if that relationship is right at the core, everything else will bloom and flow out of it. And the key thing he's going to say is you have to ask, you have to seek, you have to knock. There is something specific you are supposed to pursue from your father. You're supposed to ask him. And if you disconnect this from the context, it could come across as if Jesus is just giving us prayer like it's Aladdin's lamp. Like here's your three little rubs where you ask, you seek, you knock, and you get your wishes. He'll do whatever you ask him. But that's not the point. That's not the context. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to read it in context and think, all right, there's something very specific, a very specific good gift that I'm supposed to ask for the Father. So there's something I really need help doing. And that's what he talks about, you know, the good gift. You're having the Father who will give you the good gift. And I think the good gift he's talking about is the wisdom to make true, wise, and loving judgment. The ability to see others as they really are and to see ourselves as we really are. The ability to remove the log out of our own eyes so we can help remove specks out of their eyes. And that's how the golden rule factors into this. It's a great summary of the whole sermon, but the way it fits into these preceding verses is nobody wants done to them what he's critiquing in verse 3 and 4. Nobody likes it when somebody who's self-righteous and oblivious and uncaring and condemning and a great hypocrite condemns them from a distance. Nobody likes that. So Jesus is saying, don't do that to others. See, he's assuming the family context. You're with your brothers and sisters, and he's assuming you're going to have relational difficulties. And see, how you deal with Difficult people and difficult situations will be one of the most determining factors in the quality of your life. If the quality of your life is primarily dependent on the quality of your relationships, your, the quality of relationships is primarily going to be dependent on the skill and the wisdom do, in which you judge people and their actions. And for that, you need, I need, we need God's help. We need his help. And there's three things that we're going to unpack this morning where we really need his help. That's why we're supposed to ask, seek, knock, go after these things, beg him for it. And we have to ask him. We have to seek from him. We have to beg him to open up to us, to help us so we can see ourselves clearly, so we can deal with outsiders wisely, and then so we can operate on others gently. 
So let's think about these things that, three things and ask God to help us do these things. First, we need God's help to see ourselves clearly. We need to ask for that. And there's two things that we need help to see clearly. We need to clearly see the scales that we use and the logs we have, the scales of justice. You, know, you have that command that's so misused, the command, judge not. And you think, all right, what does this mean? Well, there are certain things it can't mean. Like it can't mean, you know, for example, many anarchists have loved this passage and said there should be no courts and no police or things like that. Uh, Leo Tolstoy said that. But it, it doesn't mean that because that would fly in the face of the rest of the Bible. And then it also doesn't mean you can't use your critical faculties, that you're not supposed to actually make any type of evaluation. You know, I'm sure there's been many... Um, sassy, smart-alecky Christian school kids who, I don't know why I didn't think of this when I was a kid, when you were given a multiple to choice test and you say, whoa, 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 I can't do this. Jesus has told us to judge not. And choosing which answer is right on this test would be me judging. So I'm not supposed to do that. Well, no, that's not what he's talking about either. What the calling here is the calling to not be a hypocrite in your relationship with others. We've seen that all throughout chapter 6. Remember, don't be a hypocrite in your relationship to God. And the way you're a hypocrite in the relationship to God is you do things primarily to be seen by others, not for Him, but for others to be seen and praised by them. Now, this is going to unpack what it means to be a hypocrite in your relationship to other people. And what I think it's getting at is that hyper-hypocrite, the hyper critical spirit, the spirit of judging with harshness, to judge harshly. I think the idea here is that what you do, what's being condemned, is when you put the worst construction on someone's motives, or you're always pouring cold water on their ideas, or you're ungracious towards their mistakes. When things were reminded all throughout the New Testament, is we're servants, not the judge. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 14. Who are you to judge? Another man's servant. In 1 Corinthians, I don't judge anyone, even myself. I let God do that. But the command is not to be blind. The command is to be gracious. In one sense, this is summarizing the type of person that the whole Sermon on the Mount is trying to create. Like if you live out the Beatitudes, and those are your character, and you recognize that blessed are the merciful, they, they show mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers. If you pray, Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive those others, you recognize you have been forgiven, so therefore you will be forgiving. It creates a certain type of person. But the calling here is not to be a hypocrite in dealing with others. You know, we have spiritual hypocrisy in chapter 6, and here in chapter 7 we have relational hypocrisy. And what a relational hypocrite is, is someone who's harsh with others, but blind to themselves. So we, they, we all, to some degree, have that fatal tendency to exaggerate the faults of others and minimize our own faults. Or we can see our own faults faults in others, and we judge them harshly. Psychologists call that projection, where you're projecting onto someone else your own sense of guilt and inadequacy and frustrations. And I can feel that in my own heart, like kids at home and trying to do distance learning, and I'm frustrated at the I'm frustrated at my inability to get things done that I need to do. And then I see them not getting thing, the things done they need to do, and I'm harsh with them. I'm projecting. I'm being a hypocrite. I'm, I'm noticing their speck, but not dealing with my log. And Jesus has a lot to say about this, a parable in Luke 18 with the Pharisee and the tax collector. And so at minimum, what he's saying is that we should apply to ourselves the same standard that we apply to others. So we need God's help to see clearly the standard we apply. I mean, you think about it in little small ways, like you're driving in traffic, and if you cut somebody off, you don't even notice. But if somebody cuts you off, you fume about it for hours. And we need God's help to see the scales that we apply to others. But we also need God's help to see the logs that we have. You know, one sense, now Jesus is meant to be funny. I think one of the things about Jesus is a lot of the humor gets lost in translation. This is meant to be a funny, absurd, ridiculous 
illustration. He's saying you have a log or a beam in your eye and you're going around. It's just sticking out. Everybody can see it. And then you think you can get the speck out of somebody else's eye, not realizing that your own beam is like knocking people around. You know, that log, that beam, this is a term that would be used for like trusses or beams to hold up houses. They generally be about 40 feet long and about five feet wide. So you imagine you have this giant you know, 40 foot beam that's just knocking people over. And then you think that you can help somebody with the speck in their own eye. I mean, in some sense, being the hypocrite is like the spaghetti that's stuck on your chin that you don't know, or the salad that gets stuck in your teeth that you can't see. You need someone to tell you, or you need a mirror so you can see yourself. You know, it's really amazing. One of the things we just kind of have to pass over, but Jesus calls them out. Did you notice when he says, and you being evil, he just assumes you, you're evil, you're a gossip, you tell tales, you find fault, you make rash and hasty judgments, you think the worst of others, if you being evil do all these things. And so we actually need the Lord's help to see ourselves clearly. We need his help to deal with that fatal tendency to exaggerate the faults of others and minimize ours. So pause and just think for a moment. How quick do you see the faults in others? How quickly do you judge them? Or how harshly do you judge them? But we not only need God's help to see ourselves clearly, we also need His help to deal with outsiders wisely. You notice there's that interesting parable. He uses two pictures, which is basically a parable. And he says, you don't give what is holy to dogs, and you don't take pearls and throw it before pigs. Because if you do, they're going to get angry, and they're going to trample you. So what's going on here? Now, there's a lot going on here. We could spend a lot of time kind of unpacking this because this is very foreign conceptually and culturally to us. But the two images of dogs and pigs, you know, uh, for all you dog lovers in the audience, and I count myself as one, you're going to have to prepare yourself emotionally because in Jesus' day, dogs were not man's best friend. They were not considered members of the family several, several years ago. We were looking, I was looking at buying a dog for a family member as a present, and this is, tell you how long ago this was, I was looking in the paper, the actual, the paper, the Orlando Sentinel, I don't know if you remember that, uh, that thing that used to exist. And there was an advertisement for golden retriever puppies. And I called him up and asked him how much they were. And when she told me the price, I nearly had a heart, heart attack. I said, no, no, no. You, you must have misunderstood. I wasn't asking for the price of your house. I was asking how much the puppies were. And she, taken aback, said, Sir, can you put a price on a member of the, of fa- the family? And I said, Yes, and you're, yes, you can. And, and so the idea that a dog would be a member of the family is a foreign concept in this world. So there's two things. They were just at the very beginning process of being domesticated. So um, and we're not quite sure what Jesus had in mind. But if you've, and you've seen this if you've been to developing countries where there's packs of dogs that roam freely and they run in packs. And in this world, they would have been dangerous. They were scavengers. Um, if they would have been in the house, they would have had a role. They wouldn't have been for companionship. would be sleeping in the bed. They would be for sanitation. They were the garbage disposals, not companions. And so the idea is you don't throw what's holy to the dogs. And now what he's talking about here, there's a lot to wonder. How would you have basically holy food? What context would you have that in? You would have it in the religious ceremonies, the celebration, worship. Some have been sacrificed, and then you're eating with him the sacrifice. And then why would you throw it to the dog? And there's only two reasons you would do that. You would only do it if you were trying to protect yourself because they were coming at you and you were scared. So you just threw what's holy there to protect yourself. Or you do it because you're just being completely and totally negligent. Either way, you, you, you don't do it. And then pigs, they're a symbol of uncleanness. It's possible it could be domestic pigs, like you'll see in some of the stories, you know, pigs. Or wild boars, you know, they would have been filthy, greedy, vicious. And so the image here, there's a lot going on here, but the image here is how do you deal with those who are outsiders who are going to be hostile towards you? You're, you, have, you actually are called to judge between the brother and the outsider. The one who's going to be antagonistic, who's going to be hostile. And what he's saying is, look, don't feed the dogs and don't play with the pigs. If you do, it's going to be dangerous. 
it's actually a similar analogy to what we might find here when, you know, like in some of our little lakes for a while, uh, we had somebody who was feeding one of the little local gators and the gators was coming dangerously close to to the dock looking for food. And he said, no, don't feed the gators. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to our children. You get them too comfortable. So dealing with dogs and pigs, I think one of the things Jesus is saying, if you're going to deal with people who are going to be hostile towards you, you need wisdom. You need wisdom. You need to not be insensitive. You need to not be oblivious. You need to not be careless. You need to not be reckless. You have these two images. The pearl is something that is priceless. It's an image in another parable for the gospel and the kingdom. It is precious. It is priceless. And you are not indiscriminate with it. And what's holy is that's what's been sanctified and set apart. So at the very least, what this is teaching us is we need to ask God for the wisdom to deal with those who are going to treat us with hostility. But then the third thing we need is we need God's help to we need God's help to operate on our brothers or on others gently. You know, it's interesting what he does not say is Jesus does not say, judge not, so just mind your own business. Don't meddle. See, what this command is not is it is not a cover for moral laxity. It's not an excuse for indifference. He actually gives you a pathway. He says, first, you have to take out the log out of your own eye. You deal with yourself first. And then once that log is out, now you can see clearly and you have a responsibility to help your brother deal with the speck in their own eye. So you remove the log of this obsessive fault finding and critical spirit, and then you can help them with whatever speck they're dealing with. See, this is why we have to ask, because we have to ask God to help us have the proportions right. We, you recognize in your eye, you have the log and they have the speck. Now, specks, splinters, they hurt, especially in the eye. You know, the eye is the most sensitive, one of the most sensitive parts of your body, and you need extreme caution, and you need a steady hand, and you need gentleness. You cannot be harsh. You cannot be hypocritical if you're going to help them remove the speck. You need to learn the loving art of speck removal, and that's what this passage is all about. You know, there's kind of two dynamics that have to happen. You need the Lord's help. One is we need the Lord's help to remove specks from others' eye, and we need the Lord's help to Settle us so we can have specks removed from our eye. You know, we need his help. You have to let people in. You have to let people close. You know, specks are dangerous. You know, I was in high school. I thought I was going to get killed by a speck in my eye. One day driving home from school, I was driving around a corner down a country road, probably going a little too fast, had all the windows down, music was blaring, somebody had just cut fresh grass and it was all along the road. And when I hit it with my car, it kind of flew up and some flew into the car and a little piece of grass got into my eye. And instantly I kind of jerked and, and sure enough, I thought, you know, nearly ran off the road. And as I was driving home, I thought, you know, that'd be perfect. You know, man dies from killer blade of grass. You know, what a way to go. You know, specs can be dangerous. I mean, they're not just dangerous. They can, they can really hurt. You know, I wear contacts. And I've only had this once, but one time, it was late at night, I was taking out the contacts. And I don't know, maybe I wore them too long or what happened. But when I went to pull them out, my contacts contact ripped in half. And as soon as it ripped, uh, it, it kind of moved towards the back of my eye. And as soon as I closed my eye, I could feel the, the ripped part was jagged and it was like cutting into my eye. So, you know, instantly it was like, oh, oh no, my eye. And I started rubbing and, oh, it hurt. And so for minutes, I couldn't, I couldn't get it out. And so I looked at Cynthia, Cynthia and said, you're going to have to help me. You're going to have to help me get this thing out. And kind of what we had to do is I had to like kind of pull my eyelids, uh, pull my eyelids out. And then she very delicately had to try and find it. But this was what I needed at that moment was a very gentle, steady hand. I mean, can you imagine if I'm crying out and saying, ah, there's something in my eye. I need your help. And she says, yep, I got it. I know exactly what you need. And she whips out, look, I got my chisel, got my hammer. Come here. We're going to pound that bad boy out. Or she says, yes, come here. Let's go. I'll help you cut that thing right out. Here you go. Come on over. I got my knife. You know, none of that would be very 
helpful. What I need at that moment is someone who's not harsh and insensitive. I need someone who's gentle. And if we're going to help our brothers and sisters get the speck out of their eyes, we have to be gentle. But we also have to have the humility and the help to let them in and to let them help us. So how does this all fit? This all fits because it's showing that the most important thing in your life is relationships. And one of the key determining factors of the quality of relationships is how are you going to deal with difficult people? What type of judgments are you going to make? You're always making judgments. Now, will those judgments be clear-sighted? Will they be loving and caring and gentle and compassionate? Will they be marked by all of the things that the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount is meant to make and mark you? Or will you be hypocritical and harsh and crit and condemning? So where does the power come to be this kind of person? You know, some things I'm thinking about, I can't quite get over this little phrase in verse 6 where it says, don't give to dogs what is holy and don't throw your pearls before pigs. Such an interesting image, and I, I just really need to think more about it. But in some way, Jesus was the ultimate violator of this command. I mean, he is the he was the ultimate pearl who actually was thrown before the swine. I mean, Jesus knew that if he came to earth, he actually would be trampled. You know, he's the perfect pearl. He's the perfect example of this. He's the greatest jewel. And in many ways, all of us, we're the filthy animals. We're the bruised beast. You know, John 1 says that he came to his own, and what did his own do? They rejected him. Or Isaiah 53, it says that we esteemed him not. He was despised. He was directed. But surely he took upon our pain and bore our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. And what we see when we look at him, we see him voluntarily coming to earth and voluntarily being trampled underfoot by us. We're the dogs. We're the pigs. And we see him going to the cross to die for our sins. And when we see that, in one sense, it should wake us up. You know, wake us up to the help we need from God and wake us up to see what he did for you and what he did for me. And wake us up to say, Lord, if you've done these things for me, if this is what you've given for me, then I will live for you. And what that should do when we read this story is recognize that ultimately the dogs and the pigs aren't those rascals and scoundrels out there, the hostile people. That first of all was us. We were the dogs. We were the pigs. And we've been transformed. He still loved us enough to be trampled so he can rescue and redeem us. And that should humble us. But it also should affirm us and turn us into the type of people that this is meant to create. The type of people who can see their own sin clearly. And the type of people who can judge and comment and deal with others graciously and wisely. And if we were, this would make us different from any other people on the planet. So just pause and think. How have you been the pig? How have you been like this pig where something was given to you that was of incredible value? and You didn't appreciate it. You undermined it. Think of all the treasures and the incredible pearls that God has given you with your life and this country and your family and your loved ones. And have you, have you appreciated those things? Let's pause and ask him. The quality of your life is primarily going to be dependent on the quality of your relationships. And that quality of your relationship starts with the quality of your relationship with the Lord. Pause and take a moment to evaluate your relationships. Who do you need to reconnect with? Now let's take a moment and pray. Let's pray for trust in times of worry and anxiety. Most loving Father, you will us to give thanks for all things, to dread nothing but the loss of you, and to cast all our cares on the one who cares for us. Preserve us from faithless fears and worldly anxieties. 
Grant that no clouds of this mortal life may hide from us the light of that love which is immortal and which you have manifested unto us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
springs flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And now may the love of a dying Savior, the power of a risen Savior, and the hope of a returning Savior be yours this day, this week, now, and always. Stay in peace.